Good morning. Welcome to new visitors and old friends. Welcome to all who have no church home, need strength, want to follow Christ, have doubts, or do not believe. Welcome to grandparents, mothers, fathers, and single people. Welcome to people of all colors, cultures, abilities, sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. Welcome to old and young, to believers and questioners, and to questioning believers. Welcome to everyone. We hope you find your peace and uplift in your worship. A uh, couple announcements. Yesterday was Stoneham Town Day. It was a beautiful day. It couldn't have been more perfect. We had a great turnout throughout the town with all the booths as well as we had some things in our yard, people selling things in our yard, and the craft group had a table, and the leftovers are downstairs in case anybody needs anything. Ha uh ha. -huh. So, also, um, there is a coffee hour today in the hall after church. Hopefully, hopefully you can join us. And tomorrow night, Monday night, it's in the bulletin, but tomorrow night is Books and Chocolate Hour, book group first session of the year at 7.30 in the parlor, and we are discussing the book Run by Patchett. All right, there you go. Okay. Please join me in the call to worship. God welcomes those whose hearts are sick. God's invitation comes to people whose joy is gone. Why is the health of God's people not restored? Why must we weep day and night for those we have lost? There is a bomb in Gilead. There is a physician who heals. Jesus Christ is our mediator, healer, and savior. We bring all our pain and unresolved anger. We come in all our confusion to seek answers. Bring all your, your urgent prayers and honest laments. God is eager to offer salvation and hope it open us to truth. We cry out to God for deliverance from our sin. We cry out for relief from our suffering. And please join me in the unison prayer of invocation. Into this holy temple we have come gracious God. There is not our church but yours. We cannot claim our world. It is a trust from your hand. Our lives, our health, our length of days call forth our stewardship. We are managers, not owners, so we come now to give account and seek your further commands. Help us, O oh God, of our salvation. And we we welcome Reverend Skip Walker, uh, Lawrence Skip Walker, today as our substitute minister, as our minister, Reverend Ken, is somewhere on the West Coast to see a football game for some team he likes, which is not the Patriots. And this, is, this is part of his 50th birthday celebration that he celebrated last month. So we welcome Reverend Skip, who has been with us before. I invite you to stand as you're able and join together in our opening hymn, number 305.
please be seated. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. We resist the great physician, for healing requires change, and we have not been ready to give up our favorite vices. We have not been eager to do the things God's way. Join me as we seek forgiveness, as we pray together. O oh God, we have not managed well the wealth of the earth, which is our trust from you. We have modified your commandments to suit our own egos and desires. We have wasted resources while hoarding for our own use what is meant for all to enjoy. Our concerns are narrow and our compassion is weak. We are restless and unfulfilled, for we have not tried your ways. Forgive us, we pray, and lead us into your new day. Let the confusion and despair of your former ways melt into trust in a God who cares. Let go of dishonesty and false riches to accept the wealth in knowing God and responding in faithfulness. God's gift to us is a quiet and peaceful life, full of dignity and godliness. Such acceptance and inner peace enliven our active care for others and our shining in the joys of service. be seated. I'd like to invite all the children up front. So good morning. How is everyone? Good. I want to talk to you today about struggles. Does everyone know what struggles are? What? Yep, so sometimes for, for our little ones, you struggle with cooking because you're not allowed to use the stoves, right? So it's a struggle to cook anything because you're not supposed to. Does anyone struggle with their work in school? Like, is some of your work harder than others? Yeah. You don't do hard things? Do you do some hard things to, to challenge yourself? And you didn't get frustrated. Well, that's very good. Well, I'm going to share a story about butterflies. Do you know how butterflies come to be? What does? A caterpillar. So it spins what we call a cocoon, and then when it's ready and transformed, it pushes and it bites and it takes a long struggle for it to get out of the cocoon. 
So I, I know a story of a man once who was watching this butterfly struggle to get out of his cocoon. And he was watching it for a couple of days, and it just seemed to be so hard for him. So finally the man got a little pair of scissors and cut open the cocoon so the butterfly could come out nice and easy. And do you know what happened? The butterfly couldn't fly. No, because he didn't have that struggle. So when a butterfly comes out of the cocoon, it pushes all of the fat that the caterpillar has and pushes it out and into the wings and makes the wings nice and strong. So without that struggle, the butterfly hadn't been able to become what it was meant to be. So sometimes we have a lot of things in our lives that we're struggling with. I know a certain little girl who struggles with going to bed on time. <laughs> well, well, some people struggle with eating vegetables. And I know I do. put some out back in the bunnies. So I was talking about eating, but sometimes there is a struggle to grow vegetables because of animals like the bunnies. But it helps us to become big and strong. So it's really hard to see when we're struggling. You know, some of us want to help those who are struggling. So like if you're doing something in school and you know the answer, sometimes you want to help that person by giving them the answer but sometimes trying to let them figure out the answer themselves is really helping the most. So why don't we take a little prayer? Dear good and gracious God, we thank you for the struggles in our lives, although we might not always thank you when we're struggling, but afterwards. We ask that you help us to use all of our struggles to make us stronger and healthier and better people for you. Amen. I believe there's Sunday school today. Sunday school today. So I hope you all have a good day and we'll see you after. The first scripture lesson today is from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22. To 31. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall not, no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Our gospel lesson today comes from the gospel according to Mar Matthew, verses 14, uh, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns where he went ashore. He saw a great crowd 
and had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they may go to their villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides the women and children. These words are breathed into us by the Holy Spirit. There are so many struggles in our lives, struggles with our health, with our families, with our faith, so many types of struggles. In the story from Genesis, we are told that Jacob was struggling. While it is a physical struggle with an angel or God, depending on how you interpret it, It is more than just the physicality of it. There is more than just physical wrestling that Jacob is going through. Jacob is heading back to the land of his relatives. And before the story we heard today, Jacob was sent a messenger ahead to let his brother Ezra, uh, Esau, excuse me, know that he was on his way back to Edom. Jacob gets really nervous when he hears that Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men. Because he's nervous, Jacob decided to divide his people into two large groups in hopes that if one of their groups is attacked, at least the other one can survive. 
Then he had all of them cross the river while he stayed alone. This is where the story gets a little fuzzy to me because all of a sudden he went from being alone to wrestling with somebody. And he wrestled all night until daybreak. For me, I wanted to know who Jacob was really wrestling with or how that person got there. But maybe that's not the important part of the story. What is important is Jacob was wrestling. I think it might have been more the personified struggle that was going on inside him. How many of us can relate to a night where we're awake and just not able to sleep? We're not able to shut our minds down because we're worried. We're worried about a loved one who's sick. We're worried about money. We're worried about our jobs. We're worried about lots of things. Maybe that was part of this here where Jacob was worried about his family and his tribe. Technology is just good unless you have fat fingers and then you've got to load it all up again. While we, in our struggles, don't wrestle with a physical angel or God physically, we do wrestle with God at times. Whenever we're trying to figure out the solution to a problem that we are facing, we wrestle between what is easy and what is right. And we've seen that this week when somebody in Florida put a bunch of people on a plane because it was easy to push the problem to somewhere else. And we were able to see where people came together and did what was right very quickly. All of us are struggling with God or maybe more precisely, struggling with ourselves, with our choices, with what we think is right and what we thought was right in our youth. It's very easy for us to say we want to be people of God and go where God is calling us, but sometimes it's hard to act. I think of the issue as heterosexualism. For many people of faith, this has been a hard road to accept. So for those who don't know what heterosexism is, it's a system of attitudes, bias, and discrimination in favor of opposite sex relationships. Many of us grew up, I know myself included, with religious leaders telling us that being in a hetero relationship was the only thing pleasing to God. It still comes across to a gay person that sometimes you're a little bit less because of who you are. And it's very hard for a lot of us to understand if we haven't dealt with these problems ourselves. So let's try to think of it a little bit easier way. Because it could be because of your orientation your political beliefs. But going away from the hot topic buttons, what if it was people trying to let us know that people of blue eyes are not as good in God's sight? So if God doesn't love the person who has blue eyes, does God love any of us? So using the example of blue eyes, I've heard from many other big things. It isn't that God doesn't love the person with blue eyes because God does. It's just the blue eyes that God doesn't love. Sounds a little silly when we think of it that way, but so many people take that so seriously and 
hurt others. In fact, they're othering people. And it can be people of sexual orientation versus straight. It could be people that are Democrat versus Republican. It can be people who are disabled or young or old. It could be people that are homeless. It could be people who didn't have the choice to be as educated as others. But so many of these struggles come because we other people. That doesn't happen to me. That doesn't happen to people of my faith. That's other people. Of course, this doesn't just happen within any one of these groups, rich or poor, black or white, Americans or immigrants, and the list can go on and on and on. You know, people that understand that death is a part of life and people that run away from it. It's very easy to put others in a category different than yours. In a way, I think that's what Jacob was struggling with. He was worried about his brother, someone who he hadn't been contacted in, with in a long time. Jacob knew God was with him, but what if Esau didn't accept that? What if Esau thought Jacob was unworthy of God because Jacob didn't stay in Edom? What if Esau thought that this was so unforgivable he was coming to kill them all? As with Jacob and his hip, struggling can leave scars on us, but can also give us blessings. Jacob was rewarded for struggling with God and humans and endured a limp for the rest of his life. He had a new understanding of what God can do, just like when we wrestle with many of the issues that I mentioned, those issues that are facing us today, no matter which side of the issue you stand on, we have the risk of people coming at us. We have the risk of trying to wrestle with what we think is right, trying to help others understand why we think is right, and it can leave scars on ourselves, especially when we're trying to argue over what we think would be pleasing to God. The next reading today, we are told the familiar story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And while I've heard this story hundreds of times, it was only recently I started to see the various struggles within this story. First, there is a struggle that Jesus had. He had just heard out that his cousin and his spiritual leader, John the Baptist, had been killed. He wanted to withdraw, to have some time alone, to understand that for himself, to deal with his grief. So he figured the best way to do that would be get into a boat and go across the lake. And it didn't work. Everyone followed him all the way out of the towns, all the way around the shore, and joined him over there. Then Jesus had the struggle whether or not to row back or minister to these people. And then later on, the main struggle in the story comes when Jesus is worried about feeding him. Or actually, it wasn't really Jesus worried, was it? It was the disciples. The disciples came to Jesus and said, send everyone home so they can buy food. And as you know, Jesus didn't do that. He was able to help people struggle with their poorness and their hunger. And as we heard, it was many more than just the 5,000 because they only counted men, as the story tells. And some scholars have considered that the amount was probably over double the 5,000. The disciples, overwhelmed with the struggle to feed them, asked Jesus to send them away. Not out of anger, not out of fear, 
but out of love, wanting them to go take care of themselves. But instead, we're shown this miracle where food is multiplied, where everybody is full and there are leftovers. We are told this blessing, this blessing that came from the struggle. And this struggle was so important, it's written in all four of the Gospels. How many of us are are wrestling with God in our own lives? Maybe right now. Maybe it's people of faith who are being marginalized. There are people who are losing, losing their houses, their jobs, their countries, loved ones, and even their faith because of the struggles. There are people that are struggling to make sense of their faith and the beliefs in a world that is very hard to believe in right now. There are people that struggle about their physical and mental health, about disease, war. And as you know, we can go on and on and on. So I guess the question is, why do we struggle? What good comes from struggling? There are many examples of good coming from struggling. There wouldn't be the strides made for equality for all people. And yes, that struggle is still going on today, especially for all people who aren't white males. This is a reality. But so many more rights and voices have been given to women, African Americans, gays, children, and the elderly. These would not have come if it weren't for the people struggling with our lawyers, our lawmakers, and our politicians. It wasn't for people standing up and saying, this is wrong, we need something better. We are struggling with health care for all. Boy, that doesn't seem like something that should be hard for either side of the aisle to agree on. We struggle with our family and the chaos that is sometimes made, especially when our families have different views from us. From Jacob's struggle, he had a limp, but went on to meet his brother, following what God had wanted. His brother was accepting, and there was lots of joys at this meeting. In my life, I've had many struggles. I've alluded to one of these, that being, I used to be a heterosexist. And looking back, I find that a lot of that came from the religious leaders that I had met many times in my life. They kept saying, well, the Bible says it's wrong, but never really showing me where. And I struggled that with many years. And I had started to come over that because I wasn't othering. I was starting to know people of that sexual orientation. And of course, God would love these people. Why wouldn't God? It finally came to a head when I got a pamphlet once from a minister who had gone through his struggles. And on the front, it says, everything Jesus had to say about being gay. And I opened it up, and there was not one word in there. So for me, as a Christian, believing that Jesus came to overwrite the old laws, that Jesus came to tell us the three greatest, love yourself, love your neighbor, and love God, If Jesus and God had a problem with being gay, Jesus would have said something. And that's where I was starting to get over my heterosexism. Big struggle, took a long time, but the blessing from it came many years later. When I was a hospital chaplain in Beverly doing my training, I would go up to the peds ward Because for me, it was a pretty safe place because if it was anything major, they would have gone into Boston. But for the parents of these children, it's their worst 
worst days. And I remember going up to a room with a six-year-old in it, and there were two gentlemen in there kind of talking with her, and I went in, I said, hi, I'm the chaplain. I wanted to check in and see how you were doing. And instantly, it was like all the air was sucked out of the room. And one of the gentlemen just went like this, leaned against the wall, and glared at me. So feeling like I stepped into something, I was trying to figure out what was going on. And I asked the girl, I said, well, how are you doing? And she said, great, my two dads are taking such good care of me. And I said, that's wonderful. The whole time he was like that. I said, well, what are your dads like? Well, he gives me extra dessert and he makes sure I go to bed on time. But he makes sure my homework's done, but he gives me extra stories. And she went on and on and on for about 20 minutes. And all I saw was this beautiful family. So I offered a prayer at the end, and I thank God for this family and that the little girl was getting better and her dads took such good care of her, and I left not thinking much of it. And I was standing at the nurse's station doing my notes for the visit, and these two arms came around me, and it was the stoic guy that wanted nothing to do with me, and I turned around Tears were streaming down his face. And he said, I need to tell you, I have been with my partner for 14 years. We got married as soon as we could. We adopted as soon as we could. I have never felt like a family before. And I have never felt like God has loved me before. How great and awful is that at the same time? And that can be used for, for many examples. For the example I shared with the kids of the butterfly, the struggle of the caterpillar is necessary for the caterpillar to become something better. The struggles in our lives are necessary for us to become better. Many times we can't see it till we look backwards. I know for me, most of my struggles were parts of my worst times in my life. But looking back, I can't be mad at them because so much good has come from them. Don't get me wrong, there, there are plenty of people who feel they have to suffer as penance to make amends for some other reason. And suffering and struggling is not good for its own sake. But it can be a stepping stone to making us feel better as people of God. There's a prayer that I used a lot when I worked on the dual diagnostic wards. And these are wards, that, if you don't know it, for people who have psychiatric issues and are self-medicating with drugs or alcohol. And we would use this prayer a lot at the end of our sessions. I asked for strength, and God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked for wisdom, and God gave me problems to solve. I asked for prosperity, and God gave me brain and brawn to work. I asked for courage, and God gave me danger to overcome. I asked for love, and God gave me troubled people to help. I asked for favors, and God gave me opportunities. I received nothing that I wanted, but everything that I needed. Let us pray. Dear good and gracious God, we come to you as people who struggle. We struggle to be with you and who you want us to be. 
We struggle with places where we are hurting. We are struggling with loving those who are different than us. We ask your help for all of those struggles. Like the disciples who distributed the fish and the loaves they received for Jesus, help us to distribute what you have given to us to others. Most of all, we pray that our struggles are worth something and you will send us help when we need it, as well as sending us to help others when they do. All this we pray in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and join with our next hymn, Born of God, Eternal Savior, number 542. I invite you to join together in our litany of praise. Praise God. Praise, O servants of God. Praise God's name. From the rising of the sun till its setting, God's name be praised. Who is like our God, who rules over all things, who is far above the heavens and the earth? Praise 
and gives them an exalted place among people, a seat of honor among the brightest and best. Praise God, praise, O servants of God, praise God's name. Amen. It is now time for the sharing of our joys and concerns. Does anyone, is there, is there anyone who would like to share? Okay, I guess everything is good. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Dear good and gracious God, we come to you today as people who struggle. Like Jacob, we wrestle with the events in our lives, and sometimes we can learn from the struggles. Other times we need your help. When we are in the midst of struggles, we can forget that you are with us. Help us to remember that while we might not be able to get through these times ourselves, we can with you and those who you send to help us. As we think of our struggles, we offer prayers for all who are suffering. Let those who are lost know that they are not alone. Let your light shine through to all who help others. Let us come to your table where we are reminded of all you went through for us. Healing God, we ask continued prayers for all who are dealing with war and defending their countries. We ask for the world leaders to find ways to end these conflicts and help with rebuilding. Holy God, we pause and thank you for the life and legacy of Queen Elizabeth II. So many people in England, in Canada, and around the world are grieving her death. From those who knew her, her subjects, and many others throughout the world. We offer prayers of condolences and peace to all who are grieving. We ask that you watch over our congregation, whoever they are, whether they're here with us today, on the West Coast for football games or any place else in your world. We thank you for the members of this congregation who work really hard to help each other, their community, and even strangers. Please continue to give strength to help them make a difference in your world. Holy God, we come to you today with concerns about families and friends who are in sick and need of healing. Wonderful God, we ask that you watch over all who are in uniform, wherever they are in the world, especially those in harm's way. Please help all those workers who need the love and compassion in their lives to help others who need love and compassion. Wonderful God, we also come to you with thanksgiving over the joys you have brought us. We thank you for those who love us, for the animals, and today we lift up the butterfly as a symbol of grace that comes from struggle. We thank you for your earth and your sky, for the seasons, for the whole world that you have given us. Help us make it a healthier place for all who call it home. Most of all, we thank you for the little places where your grace shines through to us especially in those most unexpected ways. We are able to join in our conversations even without us knowing it at the moment. Wonderful God, we now lift up to you those prayers that are deep in our hearts. Holy God, the great I am. Hear all of these prayers, both those said out loud and those said deep inside us. We ask your guidance in our daily lives. We thank you for always being with us, especially when we are having a hard time knowing you are. We thank you for leading us and helping us to discern where you want us to go. 
We thank you for meeting us where we are. We are always stronger when we let you be with us. Please bless this church, this congregation, and all whom they love as we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Amen. As managers of God, uh, managers for God of the world's resources, we share the hurt of those who are poor, sick, and in mourning. Our wealth is meant to bring good news to them in Jesus' name. We invest in this church outreach that our money may serve God and not trap us in ideology. As most of you know, the money is at the, uh, the collection plate is at the back of the church. Um, hopefully we can get through the COVID situation that's been with us for a while. Um, but if anyone would like to make a donation there, they can on the way out or through the church during the week.
join me in our unison prayer of dedication. We give, loving God, because of your generosity to us. We share because this is your will for us. In faithfulness to your call, we seek to manage the resources you provide for the greatest benefit to humankind. May they bring a bit closer on awareness of your intentions for us and your rule among us. We worship and serve you with all that we have. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you're able and join together in our closing hymn, More Love to Thee, O Christ, number 400. ask everyone to be seated for a moment. Um, I get asked questions many times, um, especially around September 11th, of where was God. So whenever I'm preaching, I like to bring this poem out. Um, it, it's my way of remembering. You say you will never forget you were there when you heard the news on a September 11th, 2001. Neither will I. I was on the 110th floor in a smoke-filled room with a man who called his wife to say goodbye. I held his fingers steady as he dialed. I gave him the peace to say, Honey, I am not going to make it, but it's okay. I'm ready to go. I was with his wife when he called as she fed breakfast to their children. I held her up as she tried to understand his words, and as she realized he wasn't coming home that night. 
I was in the stairwell of the 23rd floor when a woman called out to me for help. I've been knocking on the door of your heart for 50 years, I said. Of course I will show you the way home. Only believe in me now. I was at the base of the building when the priest ministered to the injured and devastated souls. I took him home to tend to the flock in heaven. He heard my voice and answered. I was on all four of those planes, in every seat, with every prayer. I was with the crews as they were overtaken. I was in the very hearts of the believers there, comforting and ensuring them that their faith had saved them. I was in Texas, Kansas, London. I was standing next to you when you heard the terrible news. Did you sense me? I want you to know that I saw every face. I knew every name though not all knew me. Some met me for the first time on the 86th floor. Some sought me with their last breath. Some couldn't hear me calling to them through the smoke and flames. Come to me, this way, take my hand. Some chose for the final time to ignore me, but I was there. You were not in the building that day, and you may not know why, but I do. However, if you were there in that explosive moment in time, would you have reached for me? September 11, 2001 was not the end of the journey for you, but someday your journey will end, and I'll be there for you as well. Seek me now while I may be found then at any moment you know you are ready to go. I will be in the stairwells of your final moments. Remember, I love you. Thank you. And as we prepare to leave this place, may the love of God, our creator, fill you up. May the compassion of Christ, our Creator, reflect in you to all whom you meet. And may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you now and forevermore. Amen.